Hey, what's going on guys? Crowbat for the win. Danza here today, and I'll be your host for Around the Rhyhorn Week 3 for Season 4. I'm privileged to be here today with our three panelists on today's show. Mr. K to the 2, a.k.a. Kyle, Baby Nick, a.k.a. Mighty Mammal Swine, and Rye Quinn. Introduce yourselves. Hey guys, I'm Mighty Mammal Swine, a.k.a. Baby Nick. What's going on everybody? I am K to the 2. Hi guys, I'm Rye Quinn, and I'm the analyst for Season 4. Awesome, awesome. I want to thank you all for joining this week. Okay, here's our introduction for the day. I'm going to say a phrase that relates to the GBA this week, and you guys are welcome to respond however you want. This week's word is unexpected. Let's hear your thoughts. I mean, I'm going to have to go with uh, Hank getting 6 0 by the one and only Cooper. Shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't have happened. It was, it was surprising because two, two juggernauts in the league going at it, and nobody was expecting a 6-0. Uh, I'm going to have to go with the Halucha being left in on Sylveon that had Hyper Voice. It was really unexpected because I feel like most people actually would know that and know that sound moves go through substitute, but then again, you never really know what to expect from the GBA week to week. <laughs> That's true. I am going to have to go with, I am I guess this is a cop-out answer. I'm going to have to say, yeah, the 6-0, Utah Jasmine, Winnipeg Aqua Jets. I know I'm totally stealing Nick's answer, but I think that was the most unexpected thing to happen this week. It was absolutely crazy. I think people were anticipating an incredibly close game and to come up with a 6-0 is extremely unexpected. Definitely. Alrighty, after that introduction, let's get into the first word. You guys are welcome to have a debate, discussion, whatever about these two topics I've chosen. Alright, first topic. Mulvone has started at number 12 in the pre-draft power rankings, at least in my pre-draft power rankings. Now he's sitting at 0-3, and he steadily climbed his way up to number 4 this week. In your opinion, guys, how has he been able to do it? Well, I think that he has started off the season with unexpected sets. And by unexpected, I mean people really have been able to scout him because he has no experience. So he has like a surprise factor to him. But I think as the season goes on, you're going to start to see him fall in the rankings. He's going to be playing Hank twice in a row, so that's not going to be good for him. And I think that once people can figure out the way he battles and figure out what he, how he likes to use his Pokemon, I think it's going to catch up to him. Yeah, I agree with what Nick said about the, uh, the unexpected sets and everything because there isn't a whole lot of scouting however i feel it's due to the fact that he isn't playing the most top quality opponents that he could be playing like this week is going to be a huge test for him going up against miguel and if we can see what he does in this match i would not be opposed to moving him into the top three for me i think Mulvone has he's definitely surprised people as I'm going to agree with you guys again, saying there's a bit of a surprise factor to him. But I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to he's been preserving the things he needs to preserve. He has been playing well, and even though I don't think they've been the most innovative or creative sets, they're the sets they need to win him the battles, and that's exactly what he's brought, and he's done exactly what he needed to to win. I think of everybody in the GBA, he has done the best coaching. Like, if you look at his game, he knows what he needs to do to win. He knows what he needs to preserve, and he does it. It's hard to do. Mm, completely agree. Food for thought. He's plus five right now. So definitely not as much as Miguel, who I believe has pl plus 14. He's definitely a consistently low differential earner. He is, but at the same time, it's what we said. He he has the vision of the end game. He knows what he needs to preserve in order to win. And if that's one or two mons, then so be it the rest of his team goes down as long as he has those one or two mons he wins and that's exactly what he's done he may be picking up one or two oh victories but they're victories even though he only has a plus five i don't think that reflects how i guess consistently he's been playing mm. it's all about the w's hey, and let's not exactly. forget it helps he has so far mvp weavile on his team eight ko's this season oh he's he's using his team fantastically i don't think anybody else in the league could use his team as well as he is okay we got some good words on Mulvone so far. All right, next topic, if, unless you guys have any final thoughts on Mulvone. I'm really happy to see him use Weavile so well, because I love Weavile. <laughs> I, I do enjoy myself a good Weavile. Mm -hmm. Hey, I had Weavile before, and there were weeks I didn't get to use it as effectively as he's been using it in three games. So, yep, kudos to him. Okay, next topic. 
Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Hank got just denied this week. I can't even sugarcoat it. How do you think that this is going to affect the Sinnoh Conference, in particular, John's playoffs hopes? C keep in mind that Cooper is in John's division. Go. Um, I think it's not going to have the biggest impact. It hurts a lot, but it's going to be hard to catch Cooper at this point. He's just going to have to do it by victories. Differential is going to be pretty difficult for him. So I think wild card shouldn't be too much of a problem for him. I like the path he's going down, and I think he could get there easily. I feel like Hank still has a really big chance of making the playoffs. And as pertaining to John, he is sitting at 1-2, and two, but he's already back into positive differential. So I don't think the race is necessarily over at Week 3, but I do feel like John has a really, really good chance to catch up to Cooper, especially since they still have to play each other twice in the season. And if he can swing both of those games his way... It's really going to help him not just make the playoffs in a wild card, but possibly win his own division. This game might just be a must-win for John if he wants to win. If he wants to win his division. Yeah, I completely agree. I I really, really don't think the race is over at all. Cooper's on two and one. John's on one and two. That's literally only like one game in it before they're tied again. In terms of win and losses, not necessarily differential, but it could even be in differential if John wins his next game. 6-0 and Cooper loses 3-0 then wouldn't you know it John has a higher differential than Cooper does it's ri it's actually a lot closer than the numbers make out and it's definitely definitely not the end for John mm. do you think that John has to win both of his games against Cooper to have a fair shot at taking the number one seed in the playoffs I wouldn't say both but it definitely puts him in a much better situation if he wins this one right here Mm -hmm. I definitely think that he has to sweep Cooper in order to get the number one seed in the playoffs because there could be one lost teams or two lost teams sitting at the very top going, going into the playoffs. So if he wants to, he has to win out the rest of the season if he wants that one seed. Yeah, I, I think I don't necessarily think he has to win both of them, but if he wins both of them, he p kind of makes the control in his hands. If he doesn't pull through and win both the games against Cooper, it's kind of up to Cooper to lose to make John win instead of it being in John's hands to make him win his division. It kind of relies on Cooper to lose more mm -hmm. than it does for John to win. Yeah, that, that kind of uh, makes me reminisce about season one, when we did have a 10 season, or in a 10 week season, when Moody Pones ended up basically, or Alex rather, ended up choking his slot away and Moody Pones ended up taking it going into the playoffs. So I, w I wonder if there actually is that possibility. That might be a question in later weeks. It's too early to tell if anyone can choke a slot away though. So any final words about the Sinnoh Conference, John's playoffs hopes, Cooper, Hank, anything? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we said it all. That's good. All right, next segment, be a coach. Pretend for a moment that you guys are coaches. I want you to think about what you would do going into next week if you were a coach and, and pose as the coach. You guys ready? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure you are. Why not? <laughs> Ryquin, if you were Crimson, how would you beat Dan next week? Obviously, this is actually a replay from, from week one. And uh, Crimson's really going to have to learn some lessons from the week one match. And I feel like he have to bring Gothitel. You really have to. You have to use that Shadow Tag and you have to use it effectively. Take out things like Chansey. Chansey is a huge problem for Crimson's team. Although Mega Beedrill can definitely put in a number on it with that really powerful stab adaptability. Poison Jab is going to be doing over half even to a physically defensive Chansey. I think one thing you could potentially do, or I could potentially do if I was Crimson, is focus on taking out Mega Sableye. Obviously, that's a hell of a lot easier said than done. But what you can you can do, you have you have access to a Clefable on your team, which matches up incredibly well against Mega Sableye. You can have Unaware to prevent it calm minding all over your face. You can Moonblast it, which is super effective damage. And again, with that Unaware, even if he's calm minded, it doesn't matter. You're still going to be doing a hell of a lot of damage. You can force switches. If he wants to switch into Nido Queen, you can carry Ice Beam on Clefable. If he wants to switch into, for some reason, if you brought Clink Clang, you can have Flamethrower. You can Calm Mind on your own. You can Soft Load. You can stall out this uh, this Mega Sable if you had to. I would also bring, if you can focus on getting down Mega Sable, you even have the potential to Hazard Stack against Dan. Uh, you can bring Stealth Rocks, bring Spikes, wear down his team. You can have phases with Whirlwind, Skarmory, and Raw Rhyperia. You have Mega Beedrill, as I said, with that adaptability U-turn and the Poison Jabs. They are putting a number on the St. Louis Rampados, and I really don't think that 
he can combat if he loses things like Chansey through Gothitella's Shadow Tag, and if he loses Mega Sableye through the use of Clefable, or even if he's just forcing switches, then you're going to be wearing down that Mega Sableye. And if he loses his wall core, Dan is kind of extremely vulnerable, and that can really be capitalized upon through Crimson's team. A lot of good points in there. Yeah, definitely about the wall core. Sure. Okay. So, Baby Nick, if you were Steve, how would you beat Geo next week? Okay, so both of these teams desperately need to win. But I think the person that could pull it out more, more likely, is going to be Steve. Electros matches up so well against Geo's team. Electros has the capability to do massive damage to everything on Geo's team. So I think what he has to do is he has to keep it healthy, keep it alive, and keep it initiative, keep the initiative with it, and just come in surprised with some coverage moves and take out his walls. Yeah, no, definitely. Electros on paper is looking like a great matchup for Steve, for sure. Semi rain team and everything. <laughs> Would you run Thunder instead of Thunderbolt or Volt Switch this week? Just curious. Personally, I don't think the risk is worth the reward. If it was like a full on rain team, then I might consider it. But one, he might not even bring rain, which would make it a lot worse for Electros. And two, trying to come in and stay around with all of the rain is also easier said than done. So. Mm, good call. I, I think I agree with you on that. All right, Kyle, if you were Nips, how would you beat Hank next week? All right, so looking at what the Long Island Red Rockies have, it's not the greatest matchup in the world. However, he does have some things that can do some work to the Aqua Jets. Uh, number one on my list being Halucha. Once Mega Pinsir is out of the way, Hank really doesn't have a whole lot for Halucha. Mega Pinsir is indeed his number one check to a Halucha with the Aerolate Quick Attack, but if he can find a way to remove Mega Pinsir from the game early, Halucha has a whole lot of potential to do a whole lot of work to Hank's team. In order for him to get rid of Mega Pinsir, I was thinking maybe throwing Sash Alakazam out there with Hidden Tower Rock to potentially revenge kill something, or revenge kill his Mega Pinsir. Not to mention that Alakazam has a really good matchup against all of Hank's team, bar the Tornadus T, his Torn outspeeds just by one base point, and it can U-turn or knock off whatever to Alakazam. And another thing that I could see potentially doing a whole lot of work is a Scarf Jirachi, fully physically offensive, with Zen Headbutt, Fire Punch, and Ice Punch, and then U-turn for momentum. The Zen Headbutt is going to be able to uh, deal damage to Infernape, the Amoongus, and the basically anything that he wants to, bar Umbreon and Sharpedo. Fire Punch is going to be there for Excadrill and Mega Pinsir, as well as hitting other things like Magneton and the Amoongus. Ice Punch would hit the Latias and Tornadus T, both of which do alright. Latias not as much, but Tornadus T does a whole lot to the Red Raki, so Ice Punch would be almost a necessity. And then, of course, you turn for momentum into probably Halucha or Alakazam to pressure Hank into switching around. So you're not running Iron Head, huh? Iron Head, I don't really feel has the greatest utility this week because it doesn't hit anything super effectively. Not to mention, Zen Headbutt also has the flinch chance. So I just feel like Zen Headbutt is the better option over Iron Head. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. Good assessment on your part. Okay, any final comments before we move into Out of Bounds? I think Excadrill does a number on Nips' team for Hank. So if... Sorry, I'm drawing a blank on his team. If Nips can trap the Excadrill, uh, Scarfed Excadrill on a Magnet Rise with Magnezone, and then HP fire that, that'd be huge for him. Interesting. Okay. Just don't run Balloon in Magnet Rise. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I don't advise that either. <laughs> Anyways, okay, next up we have Out of Bounds. For the third week in a row, Geo has faced a disconnection. I've even heard some accusations about it being intentional. I don't think that's the case, obviously, but it still is definitely a problem. What do you guys think should be done about this? Should they stay the course and see how it goes, uh, move to Showdown, or should Geo go to McDonald's for the Wi-Fi? Let's hear your thoughts. I believe three things should happen. One, if it happens again next week, it should either be monitored and looked at from a perspective of could he be doing this on him by himself? 
And if so, then they should be taking some sort of action, whether it be penalizing him, which I don't think he actually is messing with anything, because you can see in his live recordings that he's not really doing anything. Sure, he could hit the the power button on his router, but what's that going to do for him when he's already lost the match anyway? Another thing, he could really consider moving everything to Showdown. Showdown, not necessarily the prettiest of things, especially for a league that's meant just for Wi-Fi battles, having one battle on Showdown a week guaranteed every week, I don't think would be the best move for the GBA. And three, you don't go to McDonald's for the Wi-Fi, you go there for the chicken nuggets. (laughs) Let's be real. Good call, man. Good call. (laughs) It's true. I'll give you that. I, yeah, I don't think there's any any way that Geo is doing this intentionally. You can tell from his live reaction, he's not happy about it. Uh, I think he's more frustrated than anyone else about this whole situation. Mm. And the disconnects haven't helped him in any way. In fact, it almost it cost him his Gudra in week two because it couldn't take a, a high jump kick from Megalopony anymore because of a high damage roll on the, the Mirror Coat Tentacruel and all that stuff. So the disconnects haven't helped him. There's no way he's doing it intentionally. And for me... I think moving it to Showdown, if that's the the only way he's going to be able to battle, then I say that's the best thing to do, because I think Geo really hasn't reached his potential yet. I think he's a fantastic battler, and he really hasn't shown what he can do. His team building's been, uh, his team preparation has been very, very solid, and it's just unfortunate there's been a bit of hacks. There's been a couple of things not gone his way, what with disconnects and, and hacks and things, but he hasn't showed really what he's he's capable of. So I definitely think he's worth keeping around, uh, even if it means battling on Showdown. I completely agree with Raikwin. There's there's no chance that he is cheating or doing anything funky to get out of situations or try and pull off a victory. That's not who Geo is. That's not what he would do. As for Showdown, I think it's a good idea. DCs are huge in battles. They really can change momentum and swing the battle a different direction than it was already going. So being able to maintain it all the way through on showdown, no timer, it, it could be a lot more beneficial. And I think it will be a lot more beneficial if they decide to do that. One Fair thing enough. with showdown though, is that there is really no, no 90 second timer where you have to pick a play and stick with it like you do with Wi-Fi. On showdown there is a cancel button. On showdown there's a 150 second timer instead of a 90 second timer. Especially in games where you send a challenge, it's a 300 second timer. So whether they want to enforce that and make it a 90 second timer, plus having a 60 minute game timer for the match in order for it to end at a certain time, that's up to the league, but that's probably going to have to be the best option if Geo does want to get all his battles in without any more DCs. Exactly, yeah. as you said. I, th- I think DCs are too much of a problem to to leave it as is and just kind of go with it and play with DCs because they, they change matches too much. And even if it's, if you know, you get exactly the same damage rolls each time when you recreate the scene, you have a different mindset going into it. It's like you, you might have been thinking of a play and then once you have the DC, you come back, they bring in the same one and you think differently and you go, oh, maybe they brought it in to do that and you make a different play than the one you would have made before the DC. It, it can change matches hugely. And although I know Showdown promotes maybe a different style of players a lot quicker and you think about moves a lot more, and as you said, there is a cancel button, it's it's worth it if Geo gets to battle, in my view. Yeah, I think the consensus here is that it's a necessary evil. Possible. It's possible exactly. necessary evil. It's, n- it's not the ideal situation. Obviously, the ideal is to carry on, you know, Wi-Fi battling without DCs, but it's what you have to do, I think. Unless you live next to a McDonald's. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alrighty. I-, I think we're all set to go on to the lightning round. I think so. Alrighty. You want to see me do it again? That was a quick <laughs> round. Good job, guys. Very funny. Okay. At last, we have the lightning round. You want to see me do it again? That was a quick <laughs> round. You will all have 30 seconds to take a stance or agree, disagree, whatever with the statements I make. I must emphasize, as I do every week, that these are not my opinions, but just topics I think you'd be interested in listening to. I got three discussion points today. Let's jump in. Okay, for number one, Shady won the moment Miltank went down. Go. I'm going to have to agree. Um, I think Shady had played very well up to that point, and once Miltank went down, it really solidified his his victory, and he played fantastically throughout the game. 
Uh, what about Saf Sipper? I mean, it was something to consider, but I still think that uh, he could have played around it well enough to still win the game. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got five seconds. Well, I'm done, so. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Time's up. Next. <laughs> Wait, did uh did he actually run Sap Zipper Milk Tank? Yes. Okay, so then yes, he absolutely lost as soon as it went down. He already had lost his Arcanine to that point. Uh and if well, was it his Arcanine or his Landorus? I don't remember. That's okay. Keep going. Either way, Superior does a whole lot to his team, and as soon as Milk Tank went down, it just completely allowed for Superior to come in and uh beat the sauce folks. All right, time's up. Right? I'm going to take the opposite stance and disagree. Shady did not win the game when Miltank went down. Although, you know, it could have prevented the superior sweep with Sap Sipper, sure. Uh, I think the overpredictions on Steve parts is what made Shady win the game. He went for HP fire, uh, predicting the scissor switch in twice, which allowed Shady to keep in his Conkelda, keep the momentum going, and keep the offensive pressure. And that's what made Shady win the game alongside his very, very good plays. He still had ways to deal with... Uh, you know, he, he might not have got a superior sweep, but I still think he would have won the match. Okay, time's up. And number two. If there had been another five minutes in the match of A-Drive, Dan versus Geo, then Geo would have won. Go. I I disagree. I think it was pretty stalemated up to that point, and uh, it wouldn't... I don't think the momentum of the battle would have changed drastically in, in five minutes. It was unfortunate for Geo, but I don't think it was... Uh, a significant impact. Mm -hmm. All right, you still got 10 seconds, but all right, I mean, ding, 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 time's up. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding, 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 ding. All right, next. I completely disagree with this. I feel like uh, Dan had that match wrapped up uh, because there was the whole stall war in there with the Gudra and the plus six it, with the acid armor and everything. It enabled the match to go to the timer however i feel like even getting to the timer uh dan setting up rocks just completely won him the game at that point because moltres couldn't switch in again and scissor couldn't switch in again okay time's up right quinn uh, i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to agree i'm gonna take the opposite stance again uh geo i think could have turned that around sure he may have been you know in a sizzle and basically no health at all uh, but he was locked into defog, and uh, Dan was just going to keep spamming rocks. If he'd have kept spamming rocks, it would have given him a switch. The rocks weren't on uh, Geo's side of the field, I'm pretty sure, at that point. So he could have had a, a switch as he uh, was going for the stealth switch, which would have allowed one more switch in. With a few good plays, Geo potentially could have turned that round. Alrighty, time's up. Alright, so here's the next one. Mulvone's Weavile has an average of 2.67 KOs per game over the past three weeks, so Weavile will get at least three KOs this week against Miguel. Go. All right. Uh, I believe that he will not get three kills. Instead, I think Weavile will get 2.67 kills to keep up with the trend. Uh, <laughs> Weavile is going to kill... Um, let's see. He's going to kill... What does Miguel have? Oh, jeez. He's going to kill the... Uh, Victini with knockoff, the Hydreigon with Icicle Crash, and Thunderous will have a Yachty Berry and live a uh, an Ice Shard uh, as Thunderous gets off a Thunder Wave. So uh, yeah, 2.67 kills for Weavile to keep up the trend. Alrighty, time's up. Raikwin? I think Weavile will get three kills this week. I don't see why its trend can't continue. It's very quick, and uh, I think it might pick up a couple of surprise kills with the knockoff, again, on pokes like Victini. Uh, it can uh, it can Ice Shard, potential things like Thunderous and Hydreigon, or Icicle Crash even. Uh, and it might even pick up a kill on something like, I don't know, Stoutland, if he brings that in the sand. He can Ice Shard it, uh, which is still incredibly, incredibly powerful. So I think Weavile can definitely pick up a few kills this week. I don't see why his trend can't continue. As long as Movon plays it as well as he's been playing so far. All right. Time's up. Baby Nick? I'm going to have to agree with Raikwin here. Um, there's no no doubt in my mind that Weavile can pick up three kills. It's a matter of if it will. Um, Pursuit trapping the Victini would be very nice. And if he's like locked in on a move that he shouldn't be, that, or that he knows he can live, and like a force switch, uh, that would be huge for the match. Um, Ice Stab will hurt a lot of uh, his team, considering 
Hydreigon, Thunderous, uh, Chestnut, Hippowdon. It's going to be hard to switch into Weavile. I hope you guys a good one. All right, time's up. Alrighty, so I think we're pretty much at the end of this week for Around the Rhyhorn. Do you guys have any final remarks for the day? I mean, week 4 is going to be awesome. Gigi. SpaghettiOs and be wonderful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Perfect, uh, perfect. I like chocolate okay. chip cookies, so go on. Okay, sure. I, I don't... I, see, I was going to say something kind of almost on topic and say that Week 4 matches are going to be great, but no, I guess we're just saying random stuff. <laughs> You can That's comment on whatever you want on Around the Ride so, you know, SpaghettiOs will make a GBA appearance this week. Someone will be eating SpaghettiOs in one of their matches. Tangrowth That's wasn't I, drafted. I'll be, I'll be eating, uh, I'll be having tea and crumpets while I watch uh, week four matches. Yep. I'll be yeah, eating. I'm, going for I'm going to McDonald's later. <laughs> Strictly <laughs> cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah, Go I get some chicken some. nuggets. And, you I know, need. Miguel lost his beanie, so... Maybe I'll, I'll sure. find it there. They, we want beanie. I heard they sell McDonald's beanies. Along with their free Wi-Fi. Hashtag I think I think in honor of that I'm gonna be having gazpacho. You got yes. it. That's a good <laughs> Alrighty. So yeah. after that epic conclusion right there, that will conclude our third edition of Around the Rhyhorn for season four, week three of the GBA. We're on a six day, twenty-three and a half hour break. I've put a straw poll to vote for the panelist you most agree with in the description. Thank you for listening, guys, and peace out. Be wonderful. You wanna see me do it again? <laughs>